That's fine. I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural Conversations in Economics, sponsored by the Undergraduate Committee of the Department of Economics. And uh, we call it Conversations because the idea is that in the seminar series, you can get some pretty technical stuff. And I know undergraduates don't feel as comfortable necessarily participating. This is really um, an undergraduate forum to talk in an economic way, I guess, about some current affairs. And by all means, I've, I've spoken to both presenters. Ask all the questions you want. It, there, there are no questions that are unsuitable. This is not a, you know, this is not a graduate level forum or anything like that. And we're here to inform ourselves about the Greek crisis. So the topic at hand is Greece. Uh, Europe, Europe and us, or the U.S., you know, the current crisis, uh, we've got two speakers. Briefly, uh, Dr. Robin Harnell is an emeritus professor from American University with very close contacts with the Socialist Party in Greece. I think they've been getting, picking your brain a little bit. But he's very well informed about Greece in particular, and you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about Europe in general and how Europe was um, set up. And what you know? Why why are we why are we in this situation with Greece right now? And then um, Dr. Peter Wilamowski is a actually he's a money manager, aren't you? Your chief right, in, investment advisor. He's an investment advisor for um, very high net worth clients in the U.S. So he's more interested in um, I guess the uh, implications for the U.S. investors, but also the U.S. economy in general. He's got a macroeconomic background. And um, I propose, first of all, I wanted you both to, for one minute, tell people how you became an economist. I know yours is complicated, but why you became an economist and why you went on to graduate school. Because I think people are often curious to find out, you know, well, where, where did this come from? Why did you end up as an economist? Just one minute on that, and then maybe speak for up to ten minutes, um, you know, what you think are the most crucial issues at hand, and then... Uh, we'll open it up for discussion, and um, we'll, you know, we'll try and um, all figure out what's going on, and is is there any hope for Greece, and is there any hope for the rest of Europe? Okay, so Robin. Okay, so so Sarah asked us to say a few things about uh, how we became economists. Um, when I went off to college, it was the last thing in my mind that I was going to become an economist. Um, I thought I was going to be a medical doctor. Um, so. If you're going to be a medical doctor, you're pre-med, and you don't think about what your major is because it sort of doesn't matter. Um, one day my roommate said, what, what major are you going to declare? And I said, I hadn't even thought about it. He said, well, the deadline's 5 o'clock today. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I asked him, what are you going to sign up for? And he said, well, I'm going to be an economics major. I said, fine, sign up for too. <laughs> And then I discovered I didn't want to be a doctor. Um, and I really have never been unhappy about sort of, <clears throat> sort of the accidental path that I took to becoming an economist. I, I think I'm happy that I became an economist. But if there's any lesson to the story, it would be don't assume that what you think you're going to do when you're an undergraduate is what you're going to end up doing. And maybe it'll turn out for the best that you end up doing something other than what you were originally thinking about. Um, okay. The, uh, <coughs> I mean, the context for what we're talking about in Greece and the Eurozone, um, we have to go back at least to, you know, the, the financial crash and crisis of 2008, and then the Great Recession that has followed in its wake. Um, and I think it's fairly, uh, I think, most commentators would acknowledge that this is really the biggest economic crisis um, that we've had in over 80 years. That you have to go back to the Great Depression um, to find anything of this magnitude. Um, my own thinking on this subject is that there, that the greatest economist of the 20th century, um, basically had two very important things to say on on the subjects of financial crises and depressions, um, and that's Keynes. Um, and Keynes basically, as I read him and understand him, um, to make a long story short, 
said free market finance is an accident waiting to happen. Um, that whatever industries you may want to regulate or not regulate, don't make the mistake of thinking that you don't need to have regulation of the financial industry unless you want to run some very, very serious risks. And, and I think that's a lesson that was once learned in the aftermath of the financial crisis of 1929-30, but then was somehow unlearned, you know, over the, the years that followed. Um, and the second thing that he's more famous for having said, Keynes is more famous for having said, is when you're in a recession, of course your tax revenues are going to be down, of course you're going to be looking at budget deficits, but if governments do what seems to come sort of naturally, which is my tax revenues are down and we're facing deficits, and then they respond by further, but by going ahead and cutting their own spending, this is exactly the wrong thing to do. This will simply send the recession farther into recession. Um, and instead, what governments need to do in recessions is you can call it prime the pump, you can call it being the spender of last resort, but a recession is essentially a situation where businesses are laying off workers because they don't think they can sell the stuff those workers would make. And the sensible response to that is to figure out some way to increase the demand for goods and services to get the economy turned around. Um, and again, this is a lesson that particularly in Europe, um, we certainly seem to have unlearned. Um, because the response to the Great Recession in Europe has been exactly the response of the Herbert Hoover administration, exactly the response of his Treasury, the Secretary, uh, Treasury Secretary um, Andrew Mellon, which is, hey, your revenues are down. The prudent and responsible thing is to cut spending. So we have had austerity, fiscal austerity, as the response to recession in Europe. Um, <coughs> And in particular, that austerity has been distributed on the economies that are called the pigs. It's Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain. There might be two I's. We can include Ireland along with Italy. So, and roughly, I know Ireland's not southern, but roughly you're talking about the southern economies in the European Union. Um, they have been subjected to massive austerity, fiscal austerity programs in exchange for bailouts, um, financial bailouts, to essentially prevent them from defaulting. Um, and <clears throat> that's been the policy that's been pursued. Um, I think it has aggravated the situation considerably. Um, and in some sense, I think the chickens have come home to roost, and now Greece is ground zero. Um, and I'm going to be very short so that we really do not, you know, just have this be a talking heads thing. Um, <clears throat> now, a lot of people are very discouraged about Greece and feel like, well, this is a, this is a disaster. And Greece is in danger of sort of dragging the whole European Union and the Eurozone down with it. Um, <clears throat> and somehow this is Greece's fault. And, and that's not my take on the situation at all. Um, I think that what's been dragging Europe down is a failure to actually come to grips with regulating the financial industries and the banks in Europe. And totally counterproductive, pointless fiscal austerity policies. That's what is driving the European Union to a point where I don't know whether it will stay together or not. It's not Greece or anything in Greece that, any, that anybody in Greece did. Um, <coughs> I also think that if the European Union stays on its present course, if they continue with their austerity policies, and if they continue essentially not to deal with sort of regulating the financial sector, that <coughs> that is what will destroy the European Union. Um, and I guess I feel that's, that, that would be a sad thing, um, because I think that project um, for that part of the world was something that could have been a good project. But, <clears throat> so, I'm not altogether unhappy that the situation in Greece has gotten to the point where it is. Because 
I think that unless something happens in Europe that changes the policies they've been pursuing for the past four years, that there won't be a good outcome in Europe. Now, what's going on in Greece is it's ground zero because <coughs> the, <coughs> the debt crisis in Greece hit first and hardest. The austerity in Greece has been earlier and harder. And the results of all that have essentially produced in Greece an economy that's in the worst shape in Europe. And what's happened in Europe, and I think, I mean, I, we, we can talk about this, but I, I think that the voters in Europe have done something actually rather sensible if you take a look at what's happened in the elections. In some countries, some countries, so we have governments that have administered austerity policies. And sometimes those governments were right-center political parties. And sometimes those governments were left-center political parties. And what's happened in every single case where a left-center, and, and the left-center and the right-center political parties are the parties that have dominated European politics for, for decades and decades now. Um, certainly that's true in Greece. The center-left political party and the center-right center political party have dominated Greek politics for the past 40 years. So these governments, whether center-left or center-left, center-left or center-right, that have gone ahead and for whatever reasons administered these austerity policies have been voted out of power. Now frequently you vote the center-left one out and it's the center-right one that you end up voting in. If you vote the center-right one out, you end up voting the center-left one in. Um, but as long as they continue to go administer these policies, the voters are saying, this is crazy. This isn't working. This is hurting. Um, we don't see that it's helping. We don't even see that the countries that you're forcing to do this austerity in order to presumably make them better able to pay their debts, they seem to be less and less able to pay their debts as time goes on. When is this going to stop? Um, and in Greece, we've hit ground zero because now we have voted out a center-right party. We have voted out a center-left party. That's PASOK. That's the Socialist Party or the Social Democratic Party in Greece. And that's actually not who I have contacts with. Mm -hmm. um, my contacts are with the people who have left PASOK because PASOK just administered more austerity and have formed all sorts of other parties that are anti-austerity parties. Um, and then when PASOK was voted out, we ended up with sort of a technocratic caretaker government that really you know, it was sort of this intermediate government. Um, and now we've had elections where the center-left and center-right parties lost roughly half of their share of the vote. And more of that vote that they lost went to left parties who campaigned saying, this austerity is pointless, we're against it. Um, some of those dissatisfied voters went to the right, including one of the things that you'll read a lot about in the, in, in, in the U.S. press is the New Dawn Nazi Party. Well, all of a sudden they have 6% of the vote and they have representation in Parliament. It isn't this terrible. Well, it is terrible, actually. But that's essentially what the voters in Greece did. They said the two dominant traditional political parties that, we've, that have dominated our politics for the past 40 years they have, failed us, they have failed us miserably and show no signs that they've learned any lessons. Um, we're voting differently. Um, however, there's a political crisis because no combination of political parties were able to form a government. So under Greek constitution, that means there has to be a new election which will take place on June 17th. And I believe what will happen in that June, election, June 17th election is the following. Um, the largest of the groups that are to the left of the Socialist Party is, is actually a coalition of literally dozens of smaller parties, and that coalition is called Sirtsa. That's, that's S Y. It's, and, and that the, the handout that I that, that, that I that I managed to come across just yesterday is an English translation that was published in the Progressive Magazine of the Sirtsa party program. This is the program that they're campaigning on between now and June 17th. Um, I believe they, they, were the, they were the party that increased their share of the vote most dramatically in the election that just happened. Um, increased their share of the vote so that they actually got a larger share of the vote than the 
PASOK, Social Democratic Party, which had always been the dominant party in the left part of the political spectrum. Um, I think they'll pick up a much bigger share of the vote. Um, I think one of the reasons that PASOK has gotten the votes that it has recently is people thought if you vote for a farther left party than PASOK, you're just throwing your vote away. So I'm going to, maybe I don't, I'm not happy with PASOK, but I'm going to continue to vote with them because I don't want to vote, throw my vote away. Well, now that their percentage of the vote is smaller than Sirtz's, throwing, I think a lot of Greeks are going to say, well, voting for PASOK is throwing my vote away. Um, I, think, I think the other reason Sirtz will pick up a larger share of the vote is that it's become apparent that that a left coalition government could actually come out of the June 17th election. It's not just a vague possibility, it's actually, you know, a significant probability. Um, and I think that will help them pick up votes. Um, there will have to be a coalition government. Um, one of the strength, there's, there's two other things that I'll say in particular. Um, and then sort of draw it to a close because by saying, well, what do I think this government will do? Um, that is a more sensible approach, you know, to the Greek problem than the governments that have preceded it. Um, under the Greek electoral law, if you get less than 3% of the vote, you get no seats in parliament. There's three political parties on the left spectrum, including the Green Party, that got just under 3% in the last election. Um, I think they're very likely to get just over 3%. And this government is not going to be a government of a single political party. It's going to be a government that's a coalition of literally dozens of parties. So <clears throat> I think those three parties are going to actually get over 3%, which means they will have seats in parliament, and that will make it easier to form a left coalition government with those parties included. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that's peculiar about Greek electoral law is that whichever party gets the largest share of the vote, no matter how small that share might be, gets an extra 50 seats in Parliament. I think Sirtso is very likely to get those extra 50 seats. Or at least that's a possibility. Certainly that's what I'm hoping for. And I'm hoping for it for this reason, that this isn't a program I would have written. Um, there's actually some things in it that are a little strange and bizarre. Um, however, I think the essential program here is the only sensible program for a Greek government to take. They basically have to say, this whole death situation is unpayable. It's got to be renegotiated. We're simply not able to do this. And asking the Greek people to continue to suffer, to try and pay off this debt, you know, is, is pointless. There was a very good article in the New York Times about two days ago <coughs> that said, well, right now, all this money that's supposed to be helping Greece, this sort of loans that are coming in to keep them from defaulting, the money comes into Greece, it goes into an escrow account, the government's not allowed to touch it. And in 48 hours, two-thirds of it goes right back out of Greece to pay the interest on the debt that's the unpayable debt. That's, that's how bad things have gotten. That's how sort of nonsensical, that's... That's not a solution. You don't get a solution to any problems as long as you continue to do that kind of thing. <laughs> so I think a government has to come into Greece and has to say it's unpayable. So we're simply not going to do it. Um, and the other thing they're saying is this austerity is also getting us no place. What we need is stimulus. We need stimulus in Greece and we need stimulus in the Eurozone. And they're not doing it in Germany. They're not doing it in Europe. But we're not going to simply continue to just cut services, cut spending, etc. All that does is throw more Greeks out of work. Um, we're going to try and turn things around. One last thing. So I think actually that what has happened is we have had an untenable sort of policy in Europe since the onset of the financial crisis and the Great Recession. A very, very unfortunate policy that has been pursued just mindlessly. And it's been increasingly leading to disastrous outcomes, um, particularly in the southern economies. And that what we're looking for is a major change um, in those policies. Now, <clears throat> whether the Greek shock will essentially bring the European Union to its senses, um, I don't know. Um, 
but I think it's the kind of thing that has to happen. Do I think life is going to be pleasant in Greece, no matter what the outcome of the next election is, no matter what the next government does? No, Greece is going to go through a very, very bad time. On the other hand, <coughs> they're going through a bad time now. And under the present policies, there is no end to that in sight. Whereas this kind of thing is the thing that is the only chance to sort of improve the situation for Greece. And it's the kind of thing that should be going on. It's the kind of thing that I hope it'll have a demonstration effect in Spain. I hope it'll have a demonstration effect in Ireland, in Portugal. Because what's happening is the traditional ruling parties simply are not solving the problem. They're actually making the problem worse. And so a popular voter rebellion against this continued sort of nonsense, I think, is what is, that, that is where there is hope. That's where hope lies, rather than sort of somehow praying that the austerity program is going to actually play out. So let me just stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me start a little bit with how I got into economics. And yeah where I'm at today and what I'm doing and why a firm like ours is, uh, for my work for is interested in these kinds of issues. Um, I actually took economics in high school and just got really engaged in it and decided to make that my major. I didn't know what I wanted to do afterwards though, but uh, uh, as I was graduating, truthfully, the economic conditions in the country in the 80s were not much different than they were today, at uh, different causes, but very weak um, economy, very high unemployment, and everybody was thinking about graduate school of one kind or another. And so I actually thought I was going to go off and be a lawyer, and then uh, saw that you had to pay to go to law school, and found that I could get a uh, teaching fellowship to go to graduate school. And so that kind of dictated my choice, actually. And I ended up at the University of Oregon with Sarah, where we were graduate students together for many years. Uh, when we finished, I went off to teach at Seattle University for a number of years uh, in the business school there. And, uh, you know, like Sarah, a lot of us uh, follow sort of this traditional path where you become an undergraduate, you go to graduate school, and then straight off to being a faculty member without ever having done anything in the real world. And in a lot of disciplines that works. I was teaching in a business school, teaching a lot of MBA students. As an economist, you can kind of get away with that. It's just talking about big picture stuff. But I always felt bad for a lot of my colleagues in finance and accounting and marketing who didn't have any real world experience. And an opportunity became available to me to go to work for a big financial management firm called Frank Russell, a Russell Investment Group today. They manage several hundred billion dollars worth of pension funds. And uh, had a background in emerging markets research. That was the kind of stuff. <coughs> I actually wrote some papers together on U.S.-Mexico, foreign direct investment trade issues. And uh, there was a group within Russell that actually focused on some of those kinds of things. So I decided I was going to see what the real world was about. And, went off and, and did that, and uh, that's evolved to, to where I am today. Today I work for a firm called Words & Associates. We are technically what's called an investment advisor. We manage or advise on about $50 billion of primarily pension funds and foundation money. And our role basically, or what I do, part of what I do is I spend my days talking to hedge fund managers, private equity managers, People who manage long-only mutual funds, investing in stocks or bonds, and decide which of those investments our clients should invest in. And so that's half of what I do. And then the other half of what I do is overseeing our capital markets research. Because in, in advising our clients on where to invest their money, we're telling them to invest in U.S. equities, European equities, emerging market equities, hedge funds, real estate, bonds that are either sovereign debt from Greece or United States or wherever, corporate debt and all these other kinds of securities that are out there. And so we have to have some sense of where the prices of those assets are going to go so that we can tell them how to strategically, or sorry, opportunistically and tactically allocate their assets. Because you'll have a, if you've had any finance and have studied mean variance optimization, all that, as to how you allocate assets, that'll give you a strategic allocation and you think about what looks cheap today and where would you want to put your assets today to earn a good rate of return for these pension funds? So we have to have a view on what's going on in Europe to decide whether we want to have our money in European equities or take money out of European equities and same bonds and those kinds of things. So uh, we, in fact, uh, very early on began developing views about what was going on in Europe. Um, 
So to go from there to how we develop that view, uh, you know, a couple points I want to make, and I'm going to go back to uh, I'm sort of give the punchline now and go back to the beginning. The beginning, and I'll start there. The beginning is is that if you go back to the creation of the eurozone back in '99, right? There are people who were telling you, "I told you so." They were predicting back then that this was going to happen, because for a monetary and economic union to work, you have to have flexible prices and wages, you have to have labor mobility and capital mobility, and you have to have similar levels of economic development. And truthfully, Europe wasn't at that stage. And so they made it work for 10 years or so, and now the price is coming due for it not ever actually been in a position to have worked. And unfortunately, uh, it's probably going to fall apart uh, in one way or the other, and you know, Greece is just the tip of the iceberg. It's Greece, and then probably Portugal, and Ireland, and Italy, and Spain, and eventually the whole thing could fall apart if the right policies are not implemented here in the next uh, three months to a year, truthfully. Um, and that'll be bad for European economic and cultural integration. We'll set it back decades and decades. But um, uh, at the end of the day, those countries will still continue to survive, and countries truly like Greece will probably be better off in the long run by exiting the Eurozone. Um, but the more immediate impacts are the ones that are of consequence to you. And ultimately, this is not a crisis about Greece or even Spain or Italy. It's a financial market crisis. This is actually a banking crisis. And if we go back to 2008 and that crisis, I don't remember this at all, but firms were laying off six, to go back to that summer uh, where um, Bear Stearns collapsed, and then three months later Lehman Brothers went, and then everything went. And then all of a sudden firms were laying off six, seven hundred thousand workers a month in the United States. And what was today? Well, the numbers were 70,000 today? Yeah, was it? added So we're going to take ten months to make up for one month that was lost in 2008. Well, why were firms laying off workers in 2008 at that rate? It's truthfully because the credit markets were collapsing. Because their credit markets require confidence on the part of savers, uh, creditors, people like yourself who put money in banks. Banks turn around and lend that money out. And people were worried in 2008 that, that the banks were going to disappear, that they were insolvent. And this is the issue we're facing in Europe today. And we'll get to that in just a second as to why European banks may be insolvent today. And it has to do with the fact they're holding potentially bad Greek and Italian and Spanish debt. But if you go back to 2008, firms could not, they were concerned, there was something called the, the, the uh, Firms could not, were concerned that they wouldn't even be able to access cash in the overnight money markets, which they used to fund their daily activities to pay their workers. And so it was easier just to lay people off. They didn't know where they were going to get money to fund their activities, and so they're just going to retreat and lay people off and get their balance sheets in order, and that's what they've been doing for the last four years. And that's why the economy's been growing so slowly. That's why they've been choosing to hold on to all of this. You probably have heard these statistics about corporations with $2 trillion in profits that they're just sitting on. That's why they're sitting on it, because they don't know that this can't happen again. And if it happens again, they could be driven insolvent and bankrupt, and they're interested in the long-term survival of their companies. So there's that analogy between what happened in the United States and the global economy in 2008 and what's going on today. And what takes us back to the Eurozone, uh, the creation of the Eurozone in Greece and where we are today, is that when Greece entered the Eurozone, in Spain and Italy, their levels of GDP um, on a per capita basis were a fraction of those being earned in Northern Europe, in England and Germany. And those were country, I'll just use Greece as, as the example for all of the big countries. But their income is a share of uh, income to GDP ratio. Their income relative to say what the Germans are earning is about 60%. And they had a weak economy with high inflation, and all of a sudden they're in the Eurozone, they get rid of the drachma, they have the Euro. In essence, it's like a 30% gain in their earnings, because the Euro buys so much more than the drachma did. Interest rates plummeted when they went from being uh, just Greece to being in the Eurozone. And so they were able to borrow. And so this poor country is now part of all of Europe, 
sees that their neighbors are living better than they are, and all of a sudden starts to borrow and be able and buy. Prices have fallen because they're now using the euro. And they can borrow at lower interest rates to now buy these things that are less expensive. And that's how we've gotten into the problem that we have today. And unfortunately, and this probably could have gone on for many more years, truthfully, if we hadn't had the global economic crisis. Because all of a sudden, those debt to GDP ratios have risen dramatically in the last four years. Uh, but the reason I say this, and I, I'll finish this up quickly so we can go to questions. But the reason I call this a banking market, or a financial market, or banking crisis, and why this, we see a potential repeat of 2008, is that um, the way, sort of, you know, you have a European Central Bank, and how do they create money? Well, we have the Fed here, the Fed creates money through open market operations and other tools. And how do they do it in Europe? Well, it's a little bit, done a little bit differently in Europe with the Central Bank. What the way it kind of works very simply, this is oversimplification, but banks in Europe, like in Greece or in Spain, are encouraged to buy their government's debt. And then they then take that debt and they go to the European Central Bank and they prevent, present that as collateral to get new liquidity to make new loans. And so all of a sudden it encourages them, and the European Central Bank is in essence guaranteeing this debt. So even though Greece is probably not very credit worthy, for the last 10 years, they knew that the European Central Bank would stand behind that they're debt. they're not buying the debt. They're essentially making loans against the they, collateral. Excuse me. They're, uh, that's they're very actually buying the Thank you. Yeah. yeah they're, they're making loans against that collateral. Yeah, well, that's exactly. an interesting Sorry. distinction. Thank yeah. you so much. Because it's really the banks. This is sitting on the balance sheet of the banks. Now, I consider this is, this is also part of this idea of a perfect storm. Because you've got the euro, the creation of these eurozone, and the fact that these economies really weren't ready to be brought together. And you've got another, this issue of how um, uh, the European Central Bank creates money by taking the, these loans as collateral, which encourages the banks to hold them. So that's the second issue. You have all these banks now throughout Europe who are holding Greek and Italian and Spanish debt and holding record amounts of it. And then the third part of this sort of perfect storm is leverage. So the same way that we used to own... When I bought my house many years ago, I put 20% down. Thank God I did, because after owning it all these years, I have no, I have no uh, equity anymore. Prices have fallen that much. But if you put 5% down or zero down on your home, you're now underwater, right? Well, in essence, that's the same thing that went on in European banks. Europe, U.S. banks were highly levered, levered. That is, they have very little equity relative to the amount that they, that they have in assets. So you'll have... So you guys all put your money in a bank, and the bank has 5% that its equity owners put up, and 95% of your money, and they might even go out and borrow more against that. So they'll be leveled, uh, levered 20 or more to 1. They have only 5% equity for every $1 of equity for every $20 of assets that they then turn around and, and lend out uh, to you folks. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, that's the easiest way to say it. Well, in Europe, it's even worse. It was two to three times that amount of leverage. So the European banks are leveled 40 and 60 to 1. But basically, that, what that means is this. If you're level, let's just say you're levered 50 to 1, that means if you have $100 in assets and liabilities as a European bank, you only have $2 in equity. If those assets that you're holding, those loans that you've made, fall $2 in value, you're now technically an insolvent bank, and you need to be shut down. And that's where we are in Europe today. If Greece defaults, I'm going to kind of hit myself here now, um, to make this story short, the banks probably in Spain and Greece are already insolvent. This is nobody's making them shut down. Basically, they're holding debt that is worth far less than its par value. They bought it at a, at a hundred dollars to a hundred dollars. They paid a hundred dollars for a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars for a thousand dollar bond. That bond is probably worth five hundred dollars today. Those banks are insolvent and should be technically shut down according to banking rules. If that was to happen, what would happen to you as depositors in those banks? Well, if you expect this to happen, you're going to pull your funds out of there. And that's what's been happening. Uh, money's been flowing. We were talking about this at lunch today. Money's been flowing out of these banks because depositors, the more sophisticated ones, the businesses who have deposits in Spanish and in Italian and Greek banks are pulling that money out, making them even that much more insolvent. But that's going to lead to a collapse 
of the European banking system, unless the ECB, the IMF, and others step in. Let me just stop at that point. Then. So if you want to, what kind of questions you want to ask? Or you want to yes. Is everyone scared now? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I'm not an economist, so a lot of this information is going over my head. Um, the one thing I just, it does sound to me like is it's an issue of regulation for the European Union in general. It seems to me that, um, at least from what I read from the news as well, that different countries have different rules on how the banking system should work in their specific country. But there is no overall uh, arching legal restraint by the European Union in general. And that lack of regulation for the European Union as a whole, especially those who shouldn't have been part of the European Union itself yet, or the Eurozone itself yet, have been causing the biggest problems, but it's causing all of the Euro to fall hmm. because of it. So it sounds to me that what the big problem was is just the lack of a European uh, Euro regulation scheme. Is that correct? Well, let me touch it in this, back to the banking part of it first, is that there actually is an organization that oversees banks throughout the globe in terms of how much um, reserve capital they're supposed to have, and it's called uh, Basel, Basel. It's the Basel, Basel the, Convention. Thank you. Yeah. We're on to the third round of that. And the one point I, I meant to make is that um, the price is coming due now, and whether Europe hangs together or it doesn't, you're going to expect to see a decade of incredibly slow economic growth in Europe. And it's going to affect, unfortunately, the United States and global growth. Because these banks now, the Europeans finally wised up. The United States forced the banks to begin to recapitalize four years ago. And so we're four years ahead of European banks today. Now, European banks have to recapitalize. But the way you recapitalize is you either sell new stock to shareholders, and who would want to buy that stock for today, right? Uh, or you basically unload all your assets that you have today and bring down your, your leverage. And so that's what's happening. And so from the perspective of our clients, we're looking at investing in what is called distressed debt because all these European banks are now having to unload all these assets at pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. And so our clients will take and put their money in these funds that invest in this, these assets, taking the risk that some of them may never pay off but that others will eventually recover in value. But so the European banks for years to come are going to end up lending less than they have in the past, and that's going to lead to a decline in European GDP growth. And so you see that already today, those numbers lending. In fact, that's one last point on this, and I see a question back there. This is what happened, this is one of the reasons we've had slow economic growth in the United States, is that not only are individuals trying to delever, bring down their debt, but banks with bad balance sheets have chosen to lend to the in the United States compared to the past. We've already gone through that and we're coming through it now. Banks are beginning to, in the United States beginning to ease up and beginning to lend more. It's just the opposite in Europe. They're actually at the point now where banks are lending less and less, and that's what pushed almost all of Europe into a recession today. Let me just add two things. One, I, I, I think for the most part you're off the mark in thinking that the big problem with banking in Europe is because each country has slightly different regulations. I, I don't think that's really what the problem is. Um, and in terms of, you know, the, the, the situation that is now unfolding, you know, in the banks in, in, in Europe, um, it was an American economist, Irving Fisher, in the 1930s, basically explained this. And he said, look, if you've got a whole bunch of banks and they need to recapitalize and they can't sell new stock, then what each one is going to do is sell off assets. But when they all do that, then they drive the prices down of the assets they're trying to sell off, and it doesn't work collectively. It essentially becomes very problematic and very difficult. And in the meantime, they're basically not doing what we need the financial industry to do to keep the capitalist economy running and healthy. They're basically not making the kinds of loans you know, to businesses to get businesses to start producing again. Um, so you end up with sort of two constraints on why it is nobody gets a job anymore. One is we got a real demand problem still and there's nobody to buy the stuff so even if the firm could get the loans it needs to operate, they're not going to produce stuff they can't sell. And then the other is they actually find themselves in a situation where I just can't get the ordinary kind of business loans I need to go ahead and expand anything um, because the banks essentially aren't making those loans anymore and now that's hitting heavy in Europe. There's absolutely no doubt that that at this point it's going to be. I mean, the, the 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 numbers that came out in today's paper are just 
are awful. Um, so, you know, we, we added the smallest number of new jobs in the U.S. economy that we have in over a year, and at the same time, the revised, you know, the, the, the revised figures for April took it down from 117 to 79. So we thought we had done better in April than it turns out we have. And of course, in Europe, the, the, the unemployment rate is now, in, the unemployment rate, I think the unemployment rate in Spain is 24%, 50% amongst young people. The unemployment rate in Greece, I don't even know how they calculate it. Um, and up until now, the unemployment rate has not been high in Germany. Um, we should talk about large part, I mean, we, it's an important part of the conversation, well, why is that? But, and, and, and it has important consequences, but, I mean, the, the news today is that now we're starting to get rising unemployment in, in, in Germany as well. So there's, there's absolutely no doubt that the European part of the global economy, you know, is sinking, you know, deeper into a recession, and that will inevitably have depressing effects on pretty much every other part of the global economy as well. It's going to become the big drag, and whether China becomes the next big drag, you know, a year or two out from now, you know, is basically almost waiting for the other shoe to drop. It is not a pretty picture. This is not a kind of, the global economy is in a situation that it hasn't, that, that, that we haven't seen in any, in, in our lifetimes. If you didn't live, if you weren't alive during the Great Depression, then you've never seen an economy, you know. Of course, if you lived in the third world, at any point in the last 80 years, you've seen economies like this. But I'm talking about the people who have lived in the advanced economies. Or look, or, or, we're, we're, we're right in, we're not, we are not coming out of this. We have been pretending for two or three years that, okay, it's coming around. Silver shoots, you know, the next... The unemployment's going to get a little bit better. The rate's going down. You know, we've solved the banking crisis. We're, we're stumbling around in the dark out there still. And it looks as ugly now as it has, you know, you'd have, it looks as ugly now as it did in 2008. Can I add something? Oh, go ahead. I want to add something. Yeah, well, no, I, I can, I can uh, wait with this one. I mean, it's just, um, I don't know it's a question, but... Uh, on the one side, isn't there, isn't there this sense that uh, maybe money flees um, disaster areas very quickly and it's not just the banks that are in Greece, that people have either made arrangements or already pulled stuff out, but it's like, alright I'm guilty, I know what I did, my money was in a Greek owned bank and it flew out of there very quickly into a US owned bank and so what I know people are doing are using the dollar once again as a safe haven. So doesn't that, how, how much so, of an effect is there, or is there? So, uh, to tie those two things together, you know, U.S. exports, 14% so of our exports are to Europe, and uh, and you know, a fraction of that is to the, to the pig nation. So the direct effects on our GDP growth of declining exports are truly inconsequential from this. The real effect is the expectational effect, the animal spirits that Keynes talks about. If you go back and look at 2010 when the Greek crisis first began to emerge, and 2011, uh, the summer of 2011, and today, we're seeing the same thing. And I think this is the biggest impact upon employment, actually, is that employers are beginning to hold back when you see what's going to happen. Because if you look at the United States, we're four years into this now. And if it wasn't for, truthfully, Europe and a slowing China, we'd begun to delever. We'd begun to bring down, you can, talk, you can say what you want about government debt. It's basically stepped in when private debt got too high and we had to stop spending as individuals. But as a, as a society, private debt is coming down. Corporate debt has come down tremendously. Corporations are in great shape. And truthfully, I apologize to the people who are unemployed, but 90% of Americans are back to where they were. Uh, getting into these income concentration issues. I remember this number. I used this in a presentation not long ago. I think 7% of, of America spends 43%, is responsible for 43% of U.S. consumption. Those people's incomes have gone up in the last three years. Their unemployment rates are back to where they used to be. If you're in that group, you're carrying the American economy today, truthfully. 
That's who's carrying the American economy. So in the absence of, if, if the world was on a coordinated cycle where Europe had taken a, and done the things that the United States did four years ago and begun to bring down debt, I think we would be coming out of this globally. China aside, I think that's worth a whole another one of these sessions, actually. But um, uh, because of, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that there, some Greeks are going to lose, some Spaniards are going to lose, uh, but there's a bigger global issue, and it's that it affects America, it affects the rest of the world, because people don't know what to do. And when you don't know what to do, uncertainty leads to a reduction in any kind of activity. And it's leading to a reduction in hiring, in my mind. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I had a question about, uh, early on you mentioned, uh, i trying to remember the words, but uh, you mentioned basically that there was a lot of large companies that were starting to, you know, like investment houses and whatnot, oh, yeah. pulling money out of yeah. Greek banks. So I mean, there's so there's obviously like kind of the beginnings of some kind of a corporate run, you know, on the banks. So my question is, when or, or do you think that? I guess it's a two-part question. First of all, what are they doing to hold off like a public run on the banks? Yeah. Uh, because it, I, from what I've seen in the media, that's not really gotten there yet. I mean, she mentioned it, but I think you know, being expatriates, it's, it's, it's different, you know. Yeah. Um, and then, and then the second part of the question is. Um, is there a certain kind of thing in the economy that sort of creates that tipping point where everybody just says, all right, screw it, we're done, we're taking our money out, and then that creates the panic, and, and I can, I, I've lived in Europe, and I know that people who live in Spain know exactly what's going on in Greece, and people who live, it's so, are all so close, you know, it's just everybody knows they're all, they all know, know people in these countries, so well, one thing happens in just Spain in the last month, too. Um, in some ways, I would argue, this is kind of counterintuitive, but in some ways, people pulling money out of Greek banks, we'll just keep it to Greece for now, is actually probably a good thing. Particularly if you're a company, and here's the way the reason I say this, is that the banks are going to have to be recapitalized anyway. And if Greece ends up leaving the Eurozone, we talk about, we were talking about this earlier at lunch, is that you know, in the textbook example, Greece leaves the Eurozone, defaults on its debt, and creates a new drachma, that loses 40% of its value against the euro, and all of a sudden they're comparable in terms of competitiveness. And so that would mean that they'd have a quick economic recovery. But the problem is, is that all these great companies have euro-denominated debts, and they would still owe debt in euros. Well, if they took money out of Greek banks in euros, instead, because what's going to happen is they're going to close down the banks one weekend, and you're going to wake up on Monday morning, and your euro deposits are now going to be in drachma that are worth 40% less. And by the way, my contract says I can't pay these in drachma, I have to pay them in euros. So you're technically the problem now bankrupt. Not to mention that the European bank, the, 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 the French bank, or, the, Spanish, or the, the English bank that lent you that money to the Greek company was probably now not going to be paid, and that just makes them that much more insolvent themselves. So there's some advantages actually in my mind in these people pulling this money now, and because it's going to allow these companies to possibly survive instead of go bankrupt. Because while the long-run implications of currency devaluation for a country like Greece are great, the short-term implications are really quite scary. Well, I would imagine too that the, with, with you know, if a lot of money was pulled out, all this that also means there there is whether it's drachmas or euros, there's still money, there's still more money suddenly, you know, oh, in, yeah. injected oh. into the economy in a sense yeah, that's not sitting in a bank. If you're one of these Greek companies or a Greek citizen, and all of a sudden you're because um, you're going to live in that country and you're going to do business in that country. And, and you've taken your 100,000 euros and moved them to England, and now you're going to bring them back as 180,000 Greek drop on drachma. Well, I, you know, I'd like to ask Robin something, which is, if you're, if you're an individual country with your own currency, you get, you get theoretically to set your interest rates, although that's uncertain in a global environment. Um, your currency gets to float, and you can devalue your currency. So why, why, if you agree, why do you even want to be in the euro anymore? Well, there's a, in, on, the, on the left part of the political spectrum in Greece, um, the major issue that has divided the different left political parties that are probably going to end up as part of this governing coalition after, uh, after June, 20, June 17th, 
The major issue that's divided them is whether or not Greece should leave the Eurozone. Um, I, I don't know how many of you have got any experience with sort of left politics, which I have lots of. And we, we manage to, you know, squabble over almost everything. Um, and if you take a look at the left political parties in Greece, well, the leaders of all those parties have known each other for decades. Um, they've all been part of organizations that have split from one another, they have bad histories, they have personal grudges, and all those things are very difficult to overcome. That's one of the reasons that this program sort of looks kind of like a little bit of a hodgepodge. Well, that had to be agreed on by 12 different political organizations, each with leaders who probably hate each other's guts. Um, but all that aside, there's one sort of substantive issue where reasonable people could clearly disagree about what was the best move to make. And that issue that really divided a lot of these left political parties um, was well, should Greece stay in the Eurozone, or should Greece leave the Eurozone? And when I was there two years ago, um, I was there at the invitation of a whole bunch of political organizations that call themselves anti-authoritarians, um, who really are not part of this political, sort of electoral political party scene at all. Um, and then also at the invitation of people who are in Syriza. And so I had long discussions with them, you know, about the Euro. Some things were no-brainers. We're anti, we're totally against the austerity. It's punishing people who shouldn't be punished, who weren't responsible. Um, and it's pointless, and it's leading to nowhere, and we're dead against this. Um, on the other hand, what they couldn't agree about was whether or not they should come out as a group and call for, let's get out of the Euro because that's going to help Greece, um, or should we stay in the Euro? Um, and Syriza is the one that sat on the fence. Syriza's position was, we want to be in the European Union. We want to be in the Eurozone. But if the people running the Eurozone and the European Union refuse to give us a way to grow out of our difficulties and keep insisting that we have to keep administering this austerity message, then we'll have to leave. But we don't want to leave, and we're trying not to leave. Now, the Greek Communist Party had been against joining the Euro from the very beginning. They said it's not right for Greece. We shouldn't be in there. It's going to lead to these kinds of problems. So they didn't want to be in the Eurozone in the first place, and through this whole four or five year time period, they've been saying, we don't even want to be part of a coalition of anybody who thinks that we should be staying in the Euro. And the largest split off from Syriza, which is the new Democratic, new left democracy party, um, they got the second, Syriza got the most votes of any of the left group parties, and this got the second most votes. They split from Syriza because Syriza was too agnostic and ambiguous about committed to staying in the Eurozone. They said, we're a left political party, we're against austerity, but we want a firm position, and that's part of our program, that we are going to stick it in the Eurozone, we're going to stay in the Eurozone, because that's better for Greece. So, one of the difficulties that's going to, one of the difficulties the new government's going to face is, well, how are, we over, how are we going to overcome all of our historical differences, and also our difference about how we handle this crucial decision about whether or not we're in, the, whether Greece stays in the Euro, or we take out of the Euro. I think that in a very interesting and strange kind of way, history is handing the Greek left political parties a tremendous gift. Nobody's going to have to decide this anymore because they're going to be out of the Euro within three months, two months, five months. Next Monday. And, it, <laughs> and it's, not because, it's not going to end up, nobody's going to have to, it's not going to happen because somebody decided to do it. It's not going to happen because I voted for a political party that said I'm going to take us out of the Euro. And then if things, of course things are going to go badly. This is a difficult situation. 70% of the Greek people still want to stay in the Eurozone. And there's a lot of reasons. <coughs> this can be, there's a lot, there were a lot of reasons for, in the very beginning about why it would be good for Greece to be in the Eurozone. 
certainly, you don't want to be a small, <laughs> given the way international finance has worked over the past 20 years, it's a dangerous thing to be a small, not very productive economy with your own currency. You are at tremendous danger of basically being sort of victims of speculative financial attacks against your currency. So when Greece gets rid of the drachma and joins the euro, it's like, I'm now protected by Big Brother's currency. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, well, yeah, but you have to worry about the fact that the same financial speculators with credit default swaps can basically speculate against, you know, your own government debt and can drive the interest rate through the ceiling for borrowing um, for your country as compared to some other country. So it's not like you really do escape. So there were a lot of reasons, you know, that, 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 that Greece, it was very reasonable for, for a lot of Greeks to say, I think we're better in the euro than we were without it. Um, but what I was saying two years ago is, that's all fine and good. But if you aren't going to be given any way by the European Union to grow out of your crisis, if they're going to just continue to administer this senseless austerity, then you're going to get driven out of the euro one way or another. And the sooner you get out, the better off you are. Exit orderly and exit quick if you're going to get thrown out anyway. Because what they've essentially done in the last three years is put up with an extra amount of pain and unemployment by waiting to exit the euro, you know, next month instead of having done it two and a half years ago. I think it was something like 64% or something like that. But as a clear majority, still, as of the moment, is, wants to stay in the euro. So it's very difficult for a political party to run an election and say, we want to take, we're running on a platform that says we want to take you out of the, take, take Greece out of the eurozone. It's a, it's a recipe for losing the election next month. But a majority of them are against austerity, too, right? Oh, yeah, like 95% are <laughs> against austerity. And it kind of sounds like you can't have one of the other at this point? Well, Syracuse is basically having its cake and eat it, too. And that's why they're going to win the election. Good for them. <laughs> but, I think there's one more question there, but I had some. Go yeah. ahead. Um, there's one thing to talk about Keynesian management in good times, because you can sort of equilibrate the um, economies that keep things uh, fairly steady. Um, right now, though, there's this just enormous debt overhang and bankruptcies uh, threatening everywhere. Um, my sense is that the people who own all of this paper and who would go bankrupt are not at all interested in having the banks nationalized, having their companies nationalized, raising t taxes enormously on the rich. I mean, the, the program by the Greek uh, party. There are tremendously strong interests who are not at all who are not ready to sacrifice their interests for the good of the international or their national economy, um, and and we have to also remember, I think, that the Great Depression did not end because they adopted Keynesian management uh, until the war came and the war forced this enormous mobilization of resources and public spending and permitted bankruptcies of the companies as well as bank nationalizations and controls that would never have been possible in the absence of the political mobilization and the threat to these elites and the delegitimacy of the elites. It seems to me we're in a really serious problem now. It's not so easy to, to think about uh, the, a program that will stabilize this now very unstable system with enormously uh, powerful and rich elites who do not want to move and who are going to protect their interests. Let me want to pick up on your point on debt overhang and tie it, because Greece actually has two decisions to make. It's one, whether to leave the euro, but two, whether to default on its debt. And that's the other one. I think that's even more critical. I think we lose track of those two. Because if they default on their debt, Greece, Spain, Italy, all these countries are facing these austerity measures and they're going through these really tough times. And if they see Greece default on their debt... They already did, really, if you think about it. They had a soft default. Yeah, but, but, but they're still 130% they're still to GDP, yeah, right? So there's still a tremendous amount of debt to be reneged on. And it's a huge share of GDP, mm -hmm. right, of your income. 8 10%, something like that, of debt payment, right? Debt service payments. But if they do that, Spain's next. And then Italy is next. And to this point about who the debt holders are, the debt holders are the banks. They own the debt. But how did they buy that debt? 
they bought it with your deposits or the European deposits. So that's the problem we run into. Is that yeah, you know, we can talk about the banks being the ones that will take the hit, but the banks are the depositors. And a lot of that's guaranteed by their governments, because those governments don't have the money to back it up anyway. So we're in a mess. And what Greek decide, Greece decides to do and how the rest of Europe decides to respond is really, uh, we're in a critical period. Okay, Chair and then Chair. Um, that's just a question, like, should Greece stay in the Eurozone? Um, the right speaker, you mentioned that you know, austerity is no good, that they simply need to default on their loans. And, and you also said, mentioned that stimulus package is needed. Wouldn't a stimulus package just prolong the effects and, and basically <coughs> increase what, the, the risks if, if somebody creates a stimulus package? Nothing's going to improve in Greece until the Greek economy basically comes out of the doldrums and gets back to work. And that's been the real problem with the austerity answer to debt. The austerity answer to debt is essentially, the austerity shrinks the economy, and as the economy shrinks, it becomes increasingly obvious that it's harder for that economy to pay off any debt. The financial markets have figured that out. But the people imposing the austerity policies haven't stopped and can't seem to come up with sort of what are we going to do? Um, the financial markets are basically looking at these, they're looking at the countries that are administering, but let's, let's take Portugal instead of Greece. Because you can argue that in Greece, they negotiated a lot of austerity, but they cheated. And they didn't really do everything. The Portuguese have done everything that they agreed to do. They have administered every single part of the austerity program down to the last detail. And they're basically in no better situation in terms of being able to pay off their debt than the Greek government is, than Greece is. And the financial markets basically understand that because they essentially are putting a risk premium on Portuguese debt that's really not terribly different from the risk premium they're putting on the Greek debt. Let me just add something. The, the drag from austerity is, the numbers vary, but five, seven percent of GDP. If you had ten percent economic growth coming from somewhere else and you subtract seven percent from austerity, you still get three percent economic growth. That'd be okay. Problems we don't have any other stimulus. The Germans aren't willing to come in and stimulate. Britain hasn't been willing to participate in this. There's no other external stimulus. There's no exogenous in injection to which, drive which growth. Was the first to part offset of your, the which, which was the first part of your question. The, it, at some point, you have to go way back to basics and say, wait a minute, none of this is going to work well until you actually get real economies growing again and you get people back to work. And so you have to start and ask, well, what do we have to do in order to accomplish that? Now, there's a Republican answer to that question. Um, Paul Krugman refers to it as the confidence fairy. That the reason that firms are not hiring is because they look at governments that are just weighing over their head. And that loses confidence on their part, and therefore they're hesitating to hire people and put them to work because they've lost confidence in governments that are over their head in debt. And therefore, if we simply force governments to reduce deficits, then the confidence fairy will lead businesses to hire more workers, and that's, what the econ that's what's going to get our global economy back on its feet. I think he is absolutely dead on to make total, to, to simply ridicule that notion as being in, in the least bit credible. Um, the only thing that's going to get economies back on their feet in the short run is if there is somehow more demand created. And it's got to be someplace. So, it will be very hard for the, this new left Greek government is going to have a very difficult time probably won't even be able to, you know, run a fiscal a, a, a fiscal deficit, no. which would be some sort of stimulus. They're not going to find themselves in a position where they can do that, which is why it's such a shame that Germany, that can borrow at rock bottom interest rates not right now and finance some sort of fiscal stimulus, is basically refusing to provide the fiscal stimulus. Now, the reason they're refusing to provide it is there are a lot of reasons, but one of them is 
they haven't suffered much unemployment because they managed to shift all of that onto the southern part of Europe. All the unemployment from the Great Depression, from the Great Recession, is sitting in the south of Europe. Germany has been up until right the last moment, basically completely isolated from that. So where is the political pressure from inside Germany come to engage in fiscal stimulus? We don't have unemployed people here. They're all in Greece and Spain, and we've convinced ourselves that because they're a bunch of lazy, good-for-nothing loafers, which is just ridiculous. Go ahead. Well, where, where would the uh, stimulus come from if the government is already broke? Um, uh, and, and they're on the verge of, of defaulting on their loans. Who would lend them the money? That, I mean, that will be the problem of any new, any, any new Greek government. It will be very difficult for them to do any sort of fiscal stimulus. But that's why you want to leave the euro zone. But it's pointless even to have austerity measures if you don't have money to spend in the first place. So th my question would be the discussion for getting the stimulus in. Where is it going to come from? It has to come from Germany or the broader Netherlands. Northern. The, 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 the other question the United would be, States. And there was a crisis in in a particular state. We would transfer money from the federal government to that state. That's what has to happen in Europe. That's the other part that's missing from the European Union. It really isn't the same as the United States. So trust, basically. So the only real stimulus they have is to cut wages, and that's what austerity's been trying to do. They push down government wages thirty and forty percent, and that's supposed to then ratchet down to the rest of the economy because it's thought that you need to cut. Uh, Greek wages by 40% to just restore competitiveness. But if you get, leave the Eurozone and you have your own currency and it devalues by 40% on day one, all of a sudden, everybody in Greece has shared the same burden. All their wages have fallen by 40%. And now you're competitive in the rest of the world for tourists and so on. What, there's, what there's, some there's, there's some language here that's actually very helpful. One is called an external devaluation and the other is called an internal devaluation. And both of them solve the same problem which is basically <clears throat> Greece is importing way too much from Germany and cannot export nearly enough to Germany. Now, if Greece can devalue its currency relative to the German currency, then you can basically do something about rectifying that problem. But if you're in the same, if you're using the same currency that Germany is, you're both using the euro, you can't do that. So you cannot get rid of your trade deficit, and therefore the, the, the trade deficit is in large part responsible for why all the unemployment is in Greece rather than in Germany. So you can't, you, you can't get rid of it by devaluing when you're in the euro. And the only alternative then becomes you have what's called an internal devaluation. You basically push the wages down. When you push the wages down, you also dampen internal demand, which is not good, and you also basically are putting the entire cost of the adjustment on one group inside Greece rather than on all Greeks more or less equally. And that's been the bind they've been caught in, that's why the left political parties have been arguing over the pros and cons of staying in the Euro, etc. Um, but it's, this is going to be an issue where nobody has to argue about anymore. Greece is out of the Eurozone. Did we have so, a question back there? Maybe just let everyone have yeah. a chance. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I was wondering, the last um, item on this list here is withdrawal from NATO. And I was wondering if this is one of the personal items that you were talking about that's kind of just thrown in there, or if this is a little bit more of a broad spectrum <laughs> thought in, in, in Europe right now. 38, 39 is the Right. This is their overall. This is our overall program for the election, and I guess I was wondering how how much NATO was going to be affected by. They won't do that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's what I was Give wondering. The <laughs> well, there, there's also, I mean, there, there's another whole thing to consider at this point. When things get this bad, then all sorts of things become possible that are usually unthinkable, including. So we have an election in Greece in the, on June 17th. So the left parties gain, you know, gain a big share of the vote. So they form a new government. Who's to say that they're going to be allowed to govern? Who's to say there won't be a military coup in Greece? Who's to say that, you know, <clears throat> who's to say that the United States and sort of NATO is not going to say this is intolerable? We can't let this happen in Greece. This is not something we're going to. This is not a situation that Greeks have not dealt with in the past. So essentially, 
it's not just Syriza, but the other left political parties do not see NATO as something that is, they basically see NATO as, as, as a potential anti-democratic military threat, you know, to democracy in Greece. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll now mention sort of another part of the left in Greece that I think is going to end up playing a rather significant role. These left political parties are essentially at the mercy of the Greek military or any fascist type of anti-democratic forces or the CIA through NATO or whatever in terms of protecting themselves. So if they get elected and they try to govern in a difficult situation, are they going to be in a decent situation to try and protect themselves from being overthrown you know, by some sort of coup? And the answer is really not. On the other hand, all of these groups that call themselves anti-authoritarians, they have a tremendous base in the major cities and particularly in Athens. There are whole neighborhoods, you know, that these anti-authoritarian, young anti-authoritarian political groups, um, they have a lot of sort of street power. And at this point, they are really the only defense that a left government in Greece would have against anti against anti-democratic authoritarian forces that would attempt to do something through other than sort of legal and constitutional means. So is that In the sense the that the Greek military knows that if they tried to take, if they tried to throw a left political coalition government out of power in August or September, that Athens would become very, 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 very difficult to govern. And that's a price they have to take into account when they're away. So a certain amount of cooperation. And the anti-authoritarian political groups have really stood aloof from all of these left political parties. Their position has been, we don't trust any of this. This is all a disaster. This is not what we want. This is, we have no faith in any of this. Um, a lot is going to hinge on whether, a, a lot inside Greece, I believe, is going to hinge on whether or not not just the political parties that are going to form part of the new government, whether they can sort of get along well enough to try to, to, to do a decent job of coming up with policies and programs under the worst of possible circumstances, but whether or not a whole set of young left political groups um, can manage to cooperate you know, with that government. I think that a, a lot is going to depend on that in the end. Um, I both of you have uh, basically said that, you're, that you don't think austerity is a great idea for Greece. That's fair to say. Um, could, do you think either of you could really uh, explain and defend where the people that are pushing the austerity are coming from? Like, if, if austerity is such a bad idea, why are there still all these people who are, like, and, and I'm, I'm assuming that these are pretty smart people. You know, these are the people with their hands on the wheel right now. What's, what's their argument for continuing to push this seemingly disastrous austerity? Moral hazard would be one, that if we, if we bail out the Greeks, then, and this happened quite quickly, you bail out the Greeks, and suddenly the Portuguese saying, well, we're feeling pretty poorly now. And so some of the problems in other countries, you don't know if they're real, or you don't know if it's in the interest of those countries, like, say, Ireland. I mean, Ireland looked very enviously at the Greeks, the islands, did, you know, Irish decided to suck it up and, you know, have this big austerity program and try and meet their debt obligations. And then the Greeks go, oh, we can't manage. And they get, you know, this giant bailout. And so then the Irish said, that's not fair. You know, why can't we have a bailout too? And so it's a bit like it, it seems irrational for somebody to foreclose on your house because you're willing to pay something towards it. There's an element of wanting to make sure that not everyone decides to walk away from their loans, you know, and they, so you're trying to keep other people in line. And that'd be one thing I'd say. You guys have some other ideas. Just to add that I think that, that I think they underestimated the weakness of the economy in general, and that didn't expect they, they thought there, there was going to be growth coming from someplace else to offset that austerity, and it just wasn't there. They thought that by creating, remember what happened, is that interest rates started going up. The bondholders said. We don't believe Greece can pay this back. It has gotten unsustainable. It's just too large a share of their income to, uh, that goes to paying debt holders, bondholders, to continue paying us back. We're not going to lend you any more. And interest rates went through the roof. And so the austerity measures were designed to bring down the amount that they needed to borrow so that bondholders would step in and continue to buy debt. And that's what's not happening. And 
didn't bring down the um, it didn't bring down the size of the, the deficits, I should say, and therefore interest rates have stayed high. There, there's there's a you, you need to read Paul Krugman's column today. Mm -hmm. see that. It's called austerity. And he's in England right now, and he's talking to people in the Cameron government who are pushing austerity hard, as hard as anybody on the planet is. And he says, I'm talking to these people, and I'm trying to, I'm listening to what they're saying about why it is they think this is a good idea. Um, now, it's his criticism, it's his critique, and he says, I hear them, I hear two things from them. One is a sort of moral false analogy, which is, you know, if a family loses income, then it has to cut back on its spending. And extending that reasoning to when the tax revenues are falling to the government, then the responsible thing to do is, it's the old Andrew Mellon mistake, it's the old Herbert Hoover mistake, it's the thing, and so this stri it's driving, I mean, it's, it's been driving Krugman crazy now for two, four years. You can read it, you know, twice a week in the Times. So I hear that. He says, then I hear something else. Because then I talk with them a little bit, and they sort of back off on that. And then I hear what I think is the real thing that's driving them. They said, well, we, government's just gotten too big. The government's gotten too big, and we need to shrink government to make for healthy economies. He says, that's really what it's about. So it's, it's a lot like what's happening in the United States, where you've got the right-leaning parties, or the right parties going, well, we want smaller government. Oh, this is a great opportunity. Right. And so my wife and I, was an, she's an economist also, we're talking about this over the breakfast table this morning. And, uh, and I'm saying, yeah, wow, I mean, that, that, that really makes sense. And she says, yeah, Ronald, but you realize that a majority of Americans agree with that second position. And I said, oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> but we really are that stupid. <laughs> so if events can play themselves forward, as we are sort of suggesting they're going to here. What will we see here in the States? How will that come across? Relatively small impact on exports, at least in that direction. That depends on which outcome you believe occurs. If Greece leaves, Greece again, we mentioned this earlier, 11 million people, it's inconsequential. It's how, it's how Greece leaves, whether they default as well as leave the euro, and it's then what happens after that in Spain, in Italy, and so on. And if, if Europe, if the ECB and the IMF and probably China can't step in and save the Greek, save the, um, the Spanish and Italian banks, then it looks really bad. It's 2008 all over. Uh, which will be, and, and that will have a major impact here in terms of that'll be a, a, a major drag on our. Well, we're not having a recovery. I'm not going to call it a recovery. It'll drag us down. It'll that will drag us down further and quite significantly and quite quickly. Do we have a bank exposure? Do we have a the same last, financial issues? Last summer, when people were starting to pay attention to this again, uh, it was announced that J.P. Morgan had all sorts of, uh, or Morgan Stanley, excuse me, had a, a big uh, derivatives exposure to a number of European banks that had pigs exposure. Their stock fell 15% in two days. It's and that's. Not that that exposure was even that big on the bottom line of, of Morgan Stanley. It's that people worry, and they begin to react, and they begin to stop making decisions. And that's the bigger concern. The direct rate, even if Europe ends up in an enormous recession where GDP falls by 10% over a couple of years, that's not going to be as big as, uh, that's not going to have the biggest impact on the U.S. as the fact that we begin to begin, you just begin to worry, and you stop spending yourself, and you stop doing things. And, I heard that uh, maybe this is still true, but uh, our exposure to Greece, the U.S., our exposure is not that big. Like we're not that invested in Greece. It's when it gets to Spain that it becomes critical because that's where we are invested. And so, from I mean, all else equal, if nothing else happens, just the the, the Greeks, you know, defaulting and everything, it shouldn't affect us. Tremendously. So we've known about this. So this this has been discussed now for two years. Right. It's become a big issue. Right. I tell you, every bank they've taken care of this by uh -huh. now. They're smart people. They've either hedged or they've eliminated their exposures to begin with. So the direct lines of consequence are just minimal at this point. It's that that this has a bigger implication for the European economy. And that it can enter into a major recession 
And not that that would have that big a direct impact upon our trade, but that it would have an impact upon just people stop. Go, go back and look at spring of 2010, where the stock market ran up for four straight months, and all of a sudden Greece becomes an issue, and the stock market plummets, and GDP growth estimates begin to fall again. And it happened all over again in 2011, in the summer of 2011, in June of 2011, the Germans said, you know what, the bondholders are no longer going to be guaranteed. And that's when spreads blew up, and what I mean, what I mean by spreads is the amount that the, that the Greeks and the Italians and the Spanish have to pay for to, to borrow money, and that's when this thing all began falling apart, when, it was, when the bondholders could no longer be guaranteed that the European Central Bank was going to step in and guarantee that debt. Uh, and then so, defaulting on their debt in Greece, and you said they're, they're one of the problems where uh, other countries might follow and default. You made it sound like there's no real consequences for, for defaulting on your loans. So, what would be the true consequence? Who's going to collect? On these debts, uh, if they're default, you're saying, or yeah, I mean, so if they default, default so if you think about all the, so right now, just again using Greece as the example, where they're paying probably seven to ten percent, I don't even know the number anymore, of their income is going to bondholders. So they collect those taxes, and one tenth of it is going to bondholders, who are not even necessarily Greeks. If you default on that, all of a sudden you freed up eight percent of your income to spend on government services and employing people and doing all that stuff. So that's, and that's not going to be sufficient, actually. That's just going to help mitigate some of the, us, the cost of austerity, the pain that people are feeling. They still are going to need to devalue their currency to, for that to be the ex exogenous shock that stimulates their economy. So if this then moves on to Spain. Spain, you hear about 50% I think you mentioned this earlier, 50% unemployment among the youth. Most, yeah, people under 30. Yeah, so that these it's very painful, and so by defaulting on the debt, all of a sudden you free up all that income, and you just basically will recapitalize your own bank somehow, and um, start your economy over again. And there's many history, many episodes of this in history of company countries coming out of this successfully by devaluing their currencies, so defaulting on debt. What happened to the actual liability? The, the bondholders people? suffer. Yeah. yeah, the bondholders lose. Great. So you and then. My question is, um, do you think the, that the money um, can be squeezed back out of like banks and wealthy individuals? I recently read an article saying that officers in Italy are stopping people who drive luxury cars, uh, oh, Ferrari, cash and board. asking them, you know, what's your balance sheet? What did you not pay? What, what no. did you keep um, behind? You know, and they're finding thousands, hundreds of thousands, you know, millions of uh, uh, Euro um, and taking that back. And do you, do you, the question is like, do you think there's enough money still within Greece or any of the other um, countries to pay back their their loans as, as their own? They do, yeah, they do have a very bad problem with tax compliance. Yeah. And the, in America, 85% of taxes that um, are owed are collected. And we're very lucky, actually, that for the most part, I, I think that's a little low, but for the most part, when you tax people, they pay, they give you the money. And in places like Greece, most people don't pay their taxes, essentially. I mean, the Italian Prime Minister didn't used to pay his taxes, and that was considered normal. Where is this Yeah, he, he was a tax he's got, dodger. He's got a couple issues. He's got several other issues. Let's <laughs> <laughs> well, wait. Sorry. All the way at the back and then in the middle. Yeah. So I was going to ask if they, if they do uh, go back to the drop do they have? Do they already have in place the manufacturing infrastructure to to, to get them out of the, the or is no, the right direction? Do they I mean, still have to? The real underlying problem is. I mean, let's look what's really. Let's let's just fast forward and see what's going to happen. They're going to default. Exactly how much and how big and how it plays out. But it's going to be a big default. They're going to leave the euro. They're going to end up with a drop. Um, they are going to be able to attract very little, if any, new international help of any kind that doesn't come from, you know, directly from an international agency that you know is. I mean, the IMF might come in. The World Bank might come in. But that's 
that's not going to be private investment flow in. That is going to be emergency, international agency, government type of relief things. So how then do you actually, you now have a favorable, you know, currency value in terms of producing and selling. But the problem that, that, that he's, that, that, the, the problem that he's pointed out is, but if all these companies in, in Greece are bankrupt, then they can't literally start up, and they, they can't go into business. They're not going to be able to make payroll. Um, at which point, then the question is, well, what do you do in that situation? And, you know, what does the government do? Because there are still factories, there are still people, there's a fable exchange rate. Um, then it becomes a question of how do you cobble together some sort of arrangement that says the physical reality is ready to recover again, and yet we just have all of these financial obstacles. I think that the... Uh, I'm glad that the new government says, we understand we're going to have to nationalize the banking industry. We're basically going to have to, we're going to take all of this over because the government's going to have to come in and essentially play the midwife to get production going here, get going, going again in, in, in Greece. Because I think there is no other way to get going in Greece. There will be no other way to get going again. Um, I have a question about the privilege of larger versus smaller economies. Very, in thinking about the way out, why was the United States able to uh, move from near default in 08 without nationalization? And why do you feel that the prospect of nationalization is quite sure for Spain? What's, in what ways did the U.S. have degrees of freedom Spain doesn't? Why were we able to skip the nationalization? Of the banks. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they were actually covertly nationalized by the Federal Reserve yeah. creating an enormous flow of credit. It's just that uh, it provided the resource without taking the control. It what what happened here yeah. that gave us the softer landing? Well, I mean, what actually happened was that the major banks in the United States were insolvent. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. government, the Treasury, and actually more of the Fed later came in and simply bailed them out. Mm -hmm. And the Fed's been giving them interest-free money ever since, as much as they want. Mm -hmm. um, in my view, the mistake in that policy is we saved them from not existing anymore, and we never insisted on them doing anything that we wanted them to do that's different than they were going to go, that they wanted to do. They didn't want to renegotiate and write down their mortgages so that we didn't have the foreclosure problem still dragging on the American economy. We had the leverage where we could have forced them to do that, and we didn't. Um, so I, I think that's what happened in the case of the United States. Now, I mean, Greece is a totally different situation. Their banks are basically going to all be bankrupt. Um, the money has been flowing out for months now. Um, so they're going to have to be nationalized because there's no point. That, there's nothing else to do in that situation. I would have been for nationalizing the banks here in the United States. Um, but that wasn't on the political radar. But it's not only on the political radar in Greece, it's almost an inevitability. Right. Right. But that is the political radar. When there's no other choice to make, the hard choice happens. My okay, um, and I'm not versed in economic <laughs> language at all, but so Greece is going to exit, and they're going to rebuild, and I'm assuming they're going to rebuild in a capitalist method to be capitalists, to continue capitalism. If that happens, it, if they nationalize the banks, isn't that going to stifle the free market, that, which allows capitalism to thrive? <laughs> no, that's a good question. I, I read that in The Economist two weeks ago about free market regulation, so that's where I'm coming from. I don't think, unless, unless, there, unless there's a non-electoral government that comes into place in Greece, I mean, if, if we have a right-wing sort of pro-free market capitalist government in Greece, it's going to be because it was imposed over the, major, over the will of the voting majority. And I wouldn't be terribly surprised if that's what we saw four years from now or three years from now. But... In the meantime, the only government that has got any chance of being formed in the near future is going to be a left government that's to the left of the Social Democratic Party. 
Social Democratic <coughs> Party believes in kind of a, an egalitarian, regulated version of capitalism. Um, the, 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 the government that will come into power in Greece you know, after this June 17th election is going to be a government that believes in less capitalism and more socialism. Now what that socialism looks like is a whole big discussion amongst all these left parties. But they're not in the least bit worried about, you know, whether or not if they nationalized the banks, this would somehow, you know, this would somehow dampen the animal spirits of entrepreneurial capitalists and how is Greece going to become a great free market capitalist economy. That's not their goal anyway. They're not worried about that. Maybe they should be. Maybe they're making a terrible mistake. But let me just give a quick response to that. You know, the United States government basically took ownership in AIG and took ownership in GM but place very few restrictions on what those boards can do. And if you nationalize the banks, the question becomes, do you use the nationalization of the bank to achieve social and political objectives, or do you make loans based upon the viability of making those loans? I don't know what Greece will do. Last question. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm not an economist. I don't know whether I'm thinking right. But so if like Greece and Spain and all these countries leave the Eurozone, does it make the Euro stronger because Germany and France and the Scandinavians are like the strong countries and does it make it even harder for Greece and those countries to keep up with their economies because the uh, Euro is so strong in there? Yeah, uh, so I have access to a lot of research that comes out of places like Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and stuff like that and they're all predicting that uh, in the short run the euro would lose a tremendous amount of value, probably fall to 110 to parity with the dollar, uh, based upon risk aversion, people not knowing what's going to happen, and so there's a flight from the euro until we figure out what's happening. Uh, but then in the long run, those who survive in the euro, which would likely be Germany and whoever else, that, that the Germany's actually gotten off good in all of this, because if it was just a mark, it would probably be a 170 or 180 euro. It was only, the, I'm sorry, it was only Germany in the Eurozone in one country, maybe 180 or so, rather than 124, 125. Which would actually produce some unemployment in Germany right yes. now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Germany's benefited by <laughs> this. So, um, Aesop's Fables, the strong and the weak cannot keep company. Uh, is that, um, is that the moral for the Eurozone, the strong and the weak? Not if the strong insist on just stepping all over the weak. Right? What would you say? Well, I, to some extent he's right, is that if you were going to really have a Euro United States of Europe, you really had to have the same kinds of fiscal transfers that we have in this country between regions, and they don't. Thank you very much, both of you. Very enjoyable. Thank you.